Hey guys, Mike from the WCA with a video from the week three session. Uh, we're taking a look at a game played between Brooks and Elena. These are our 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock students. Um, I'm really not sure which class it came from because sometimes the players will uh, bounce back and forth between the two classes, which is okay because the content is pretty much the same. And at this level, um, there are a couple of things that we look for to make sure that we're seeing some progress. And in this game, we saw a lot of progress. We were really, really happy with the way these kids played. Um, it was a typical seesaw um, in that earlier in this position, and we're not going to show you the, the whole opening. Uh, Brooks had a chance to win some material and missed it. Um, and then, as you'll see later on, each player uh, kind of went back and forth, which is not only normal, it's really um, what you expect in scholastic chess because not everybody can see all the tactics, right? So it's pretty common to have you guys go back and forth. What we were very impressed with though is the, the way um, they found some counterplay and, and it was really way above their ratings the way the game was played, okay? So let's take a look from this position. Um, here it's white to play and nothing fancy. You're just going to see the pieces start to come out. So um, white plays bishop to f4. Elena castles. Brooks plays bishop to c4. Nothing fancy, right? Just simple developing moves. d6. White castles. And um, Elena plays a pretty cool move. She plays bishop g4 attacking the queen. So here Brooks isn't going to take that bishop because of the knight on f6. But the question is, well, why play the bishop to g4 if he can just put the pawn on f3 and chase it away? Isn't she going to lose a little bit of time here? And the answer to that question is, well, she's not because she challenged his bishop, which is not protected. So he's going to have to make a decision here um, about this bishop. It's being attacked. So in a way, she sort of wins her tempo back from getting this pawn to move, but she had another reason for putting the bishop here. Um, when she got the pawn to move up, you guys will see that she opened up this diagonal leading to Brooks's king. And later in the game, um, we're going to analyze a position that could have happened, and you'll see that this open diagonal could have come into play. So this kind of move here, um, bishop g4 is common, you know, even at the grandmaster level. They'll play moves knowing you're not going to lose your queen. I mean, Brooks is a good player. He's not going to let the queen sit there. But you'll, you'll see that they don't mind getting chased away in this kind of position because it opens a diagonal to the king. If you do it on this side of the board, you might just be wasting time. But in this position, I think Elena made a good choice. Okay, bishop went to e6. And now Brooks has one of those uh, decisions to make, should I make a fair trade? Well, he ended up making the trade on e6, and we thought, well, maybe he can go to b3 and see if Elena takes him, because if she does take, and he takes back with the a-pawn, at least he has an open file for his rook. Um, but he took right away, and Elena takes back, and... By taking back, she opens up the rook, and she puts a pawn in the middle of the board. So, you know, the game is pretty much balanced. He puts her in a pin. He plays bishop to g5, and Elena says, you know, I, I'm not into having you pinning my knight, so I want to get this problem taken care of. It's a good move, h6. It's like, okay, let's see what you want to do. And here, Brooks made the trade. He took the knight. But I want to give you guys a chance to think about if that was the right decision or not because you know chess is a hard game right one of the things that makes it so hard it's not always calculating these long variations or memorizing openings 20 moves out yeah you know that stuff is hard but sometimes the simple capture something like this a simple bishop for knight um, can be a really tough decision so I want to give you a couple of clues here that might help you in the future in a position like this um, when you have the only bishop that's left in the game, very often you're going to see that masters will not trade that bishop off. They'll keep it. So let's say they put it on a square like e3. These are the kind of moves when you see a master make them, you get a little confused and go, okay, I don't get it. If I take the knight, I'm making a fair trade. Nothing bad can happen to me. And if I put the bishop here, he, he is guarding this diagonal, but 
you know, what's he going to do? He's not going to touch this pawn up here. I don't really get the point of keeping the bishop. Well, the answer is there isn't anything clear right now um, that that bishop's going to do that's so exciting. The problem is for black, as the game goes on, if the board opens up, especially in the center, white has the only bishop left. And remember, bishops are long-range pieces. If the board opens up in the middle, the knights are not going to be as happy because they kind of need lots of pawns in the middle or at least a couple further up the board um, so they can use them as outpost squares. And you're going to see uh, that actually happen later. So try to remember this. Unless you're getting something really clear by giving up your, uh, your bishop, keep it. Keep it on the board, you know. If you gain material or a, a structural advantage, then by all means make the trade. But if it's not clear that you're getting something for it, keep the piece. Um, so what he did was he took the knight and Elena has three ways to take back and she takes the most natural way. She takes with the queen and I like her capture because I'll, I'll highlight the top rank for you. You see how it connected the rooks? So when Brooks makes the trade up there, Elena um, gets the rooks kind of connected for free because the queen comes out to make the recapture and all of a sudden the rooks are free to go wherever they please. And if you look down here, white still has to play one extra move to get the queen into the game. These are not big mistakes at all, and this game is pretty level. Um, but it's just the kind of thing that as you're improving, you're going to consider more before you make those trades. Okay, now Brooks, give him some credit for being aggressive, changes the pawn structure. He wants to either attack the queen or move those pawns up the board. And um, when you change the pawn structure, you have to be careful um, that you don't need those pawns uh, in the future back here protecting the king. Because remember, they don't go backwards, right? No big deal, really. It's, uh, it's fine to do this. Elena jumps in with knight d4. Good aggressive move. And Brooks makes a mistake. His idea is really good, but the timing is not. He plays pawn e5. His idea is great. He wants to break the connection between Elena's queen and her knight. So now the queen could just take this. But what he missed was when she takes back here, the pawn protects the knight. And there's really no way to take advantage of... Um, the disconnection there, right? So I think what he was hoping for was this move, taking back here, opening up the rook to the queen, but she can just take that pawn too, protecting the knight. And if he continues to go on, let's say here with rook e1 to attack the queen, um, the queen has some really good squares, especially this one. And the reason I'm pointing it out to you um, is let's turn the old highlights on remember this diagonal when Elena played that bishop here to g4 and provoked that pawn to move up well in this case that's a really really strong square so if Brooks wasn't careful here and got into this position and let's say he just you know blindly goes after the queen again he's gonna run into moves like this knight f3 double check um, this can be really really bad for him um, if you go into the corner um, you, you could walk into some tricks like knight takes rook. It's like, oh no, my queen is attacked. Um, you can't take the queen because if you take the queen, you're going to get mated down here on f1, right? So none of this happened, but it could have happened in the game. Um, so back here, after the first trade, Brooks, he probably saw that at that point and decided, well, I better not give another pawn away that way. I'll try to play a trick and open up the line to the queen this way. But Elena, to her credit, just very calmly takes with the pawn, and all of a sudden Brooks uh, finds himself down two pawns. But he doesn't give up, and this is what we really liked about this game. He's down two pawns, but he plays a really aggressive move. Attacking the queen and attacking the pawn on c7. That's a double attack, um, and Elena kind of you know, got shook up here a little bit because she played the wrong move. And that's very common. When you play aggressively, when you go after your opponent's pieces and you play really sharp moves, very often you can make your, your opponents uncomfortable. If you keep attacking me, then every time it's my turn to move, I'm either defending something or I'm guarding something or moving around somewhere, getting out of danger. 
It makes me uncomfortable. If you make me uncomfortable, there's a better chance that I'm going to blunder. If you keep playing quiet, safe moves, you're giving me a chance to kind of relax and take my time in the position and really think about my own plans. Brooks's move is very aggressive. And it could be that he, he threw her in this position because if she just plays queen d6, guarding, uh, guarding the pawn on c7 and attacking the knight, um, she'd have a really strong position. And I want to show you something here, a little comparison. Let's say Brooks likes this square, and I don't blame him. This is a terrific square for the knight, right? And he tries to support it with the move c4. Um, c4 gives us a chance to talk about the two knights that I've highlighted for you. The two knights are on absolutely gorgeous squares if, you, if you're a chess player. You'd love to have your knights in your opponent's side of the board protected by your own pawns, especially when the piece that you're supporting here cannot be chased away by another pawn. Well, all that is true for this knight, but it's not true for White's knight because if he tries to protect his knight, Elena can just kick it out, say he goes home, and then if you compare the two knights now, you'll see the difference. This is a true outpost square. It's a square that's in your opponent's territory, protected by one of your own pawns, and it cannot be chased away by an enemy pawn. This knight is, is probably as strong as any rook on the board right now. All right, so that's just a little uh, something could, that could have happened if Elena had found the move queen d6, but after knight d5, she blunders, and she walks right into a fork. She plays queen e6. So she goes from being up a couple of pawns to actually being down material. So Brooks forked her. To her credit, she played queen c4. She put her queen on a real aggressive square and noticed that it's in white's territory. So she's not going to give up. She's going to keep fighting in this position, right? Brooks takes the knight in the corner. She retakes. And in this position, Brooks got the feeling that we all get when we look up and we see our opponent's pieces on our side of the board. We don't like that. We want to chase them away. I don't blame him. Question is, which piece do you chase away? Well, in this position, he decided to chase away uh, the knight. Um, I'm sorry, the queen. He probably should have went after the knight here. Um, let me show you why. If you, if you go after the knight with c3, she could play a check. But after king h1, the knight which usually does really well with the queen, they coordinate really well, in this position doesn't quite have um, enough coordination and enough going on. Black has to worry about this pawn up here. Um, if you're not careful and you guard it with the pawn, you might let the white queen in. Um, so pawn c3 may have given Brooks a little bit more um, of a defensive um, position. Once, once the knight's at her there, then you can start thinking about offense, getting your rooks going. So here, instead of chasing the knight away, he went after a much bigger fish, and he went after the queen. Good idea, except he weakened this square here on c3, and Elena, again, to her credit, played an offensive move, kept the queen in the game in his position, um, which we really like to see. Um, Brooks must have been listening in our classes, and we're really happy to see the way these kids played. He knows that when you're up material, it's, it's usually a good idea to trade. And if you feel like you're getting attacked, like, you know, Elaine is trying to get the queen and knight to work together, you know, get the queens off the board. So he offers her the trade, and she takes it. By taking the trade, he takes back. And this position is kind of interesting now. He gets the queen off the board. She goes for the trade, right? But let me, let me highlight something for you. By doing so, you have here an outposted knight. Um, as we talked about, the only way to get rid of this thing would be to try to take that pawn off the board somehow, and that's not so easy to do. Um, you, have to, you have to make sure that you can get out of there pretty well without getting forked. Um, you can't challenge her so easily, so um, in this position after the pawn takes, Elena checked right away, but let's, let's go back. 
what if she had taken the file? You know, sometimes players, if they rush, they might think, um, you know, a move like this is good, and it is good, but you just have to watch out for forks down here. There could be some problems. Um, other players in this position will challenge the rook immediately, and that loses. This is just a two-move combination. You guys should be able to see this. Just rook takes, rook takes, and knight check, and black is winning. So you can see that that knight is really, really strong on, uh, on d4. So after the trade, Elena instead plays knight e2 check. And the check we have to be careful about. Remember, the knight was posted really well. The rook in the corner wasn't doing enough work. You really should get that piece going. But after the check, Brooks decides to um, uh, put the king in the corner. And here in the end game, you really have to consider bringing your king out as well. Uh, don't be afraid to use the king in the end game. But he puts it in the corner, safe and sound. And Elena plays f4 to protect her, uh, her pawn. Rook, uh, Brooks challenges the knight, and here's a real important moment in the game. I hope you guys um, really pay attention to this. Elena plays an attacking move. She plays knight to c3, attacking the pawn here on a2, which gives Brooks a decision to make. He can protect the pawn by moving it. He can protect the pawn with one of his rooks. Or he can ignore the attack and go on the attack himself which we think uh, he should have done. So we actually looked at this position after the game was played, and we thought that um, rook takes pawn was really strong because if black goes to take the uh, pawn in the corner, the second rook comes into the game. And I think Brooks was afraid of this variation because he thought a move like rook c8 might give her some play on this line because rook down here could mate the king, right? But what we noticed was you can play a blocking move, rook c4, and if Elena continues getting sneaky, trying to mate Brooks on f1, now he has this really cool move, king g1. And I want you to look at these highlights for a moment. Let's say we got to this position, and at this level, even at any level, not, not just the scholastic level, at any level of chess you can get a position like this. And I want to show you the advantages that white have, has. Uh, let's do some highlights. All right, first the rooks. Why do we have the arrows? Well, in this position, there are three open files. The three rooks that are left in the game are all doing what they were uh, made to do, controlling open files. The difference is the black rook on F, uh, F8 cannot come into white's territory. The king does a great job of covering these two squares. The pawn on G2 is covering F3. And the rook on c4 is covering the f4 square, which means if the black rook is going to move again on this line, it cannot come into white's territory, which means it can't attack. The white rooks at any moment can come into uh, black's territory. Let's look at the last highlight, the knight on a2. It's completely out of play. As a matter of fact, right now it only has one, two, three legal moves, and in all three moves, you'll lose the knight. The rook uh, will just take. Okay, so had this position occurred, Brooks would have had a really, really nice grip on the position. So when she attacked his pawn, he must have been worried about his back rank. He decided to protect it with the rook. So keep in mind, unless your opponent has a direct threat, keep your pieces active, and especially rooks. You're much better off taking the pawns and letting her grab one than playing defense with the rooks. They're really made to attack those pieces. Okay, so as soon as he plays that one quiet move, Elena jumps right in and activates her rook. And now after the trade, she takes on d3. And there's a huge difference here. I want you to just compare that for a moment to this position. In the highlighted position, Elena's rook is on f8, kind of shut out of the game, even though it looks really good, right? In the game continuation here, look where her rook is. So she managed to get it from a8 to d3, and her remaining pieces are really active. So rooks, uh, Brooks continues to play. Rook e8 check. Yeah, Brooks and Rooks, too many rhymes. Um, check. And why not king f7? We'll, we'll tell Elena when we go over the game in class, you know, don't be afraid to use the king. 
on these positions. You guard this square, keeping the rook out. You attack the rook. You gain a tempo. Um, in the end game, use the king. It's a fighter. But her move is okay, right? She puts the king on h7. Brooks starts to activate his king. A check. A block and a really good move, rook d2. She doesn't want to trade rooks, leaving her knight the only piece against uh, the remaining rook. That would be tough to hold. And by keeping the pieces so active, um, she takes advantage of a blunder that rook, uh, Brooks makes. He takes the pawn on f4, which is going to cost him an exchange. He missed this knight fork. But I want to point something out to you. Let's go back for just one moment, this position, right? With the rook on d2 and the knight on c3. Again, let's quickly go back to the highlight. You see the knight over here on a2? It's completely out of play, right? If I blunder against you and your pieces are out of play, what am I really blundering? Chances are I'm just blundering a pawn. I might give a check away or square. But if I blunder when your pieces are really active, there's an excellent chance that you're going to do a lot more damage, like here. Rook takes, the knight on c3 can still reach the king. If the knight was here on a2, it wouldn't be able to do that, okay? So please remember this, guys. And from here, I was, I was kind of happy the way this game ended because both players fought so hard and so well, and they kind of shared mistakes that the game ends in a draw. So after these trades, this, this snapshot looks like it could have come from any master game, right? So... Now they just play like two grandmasters trading off pawns in a rook ending. They just make these natural moves and you would, this is so common, you would see this at the master level. And they both kind of like pretend they're gonna make queens. A quick check, king comes to h2, a3, b5, a2. And at this point, black says, you know what, your pawn's getting a little dangerous. White says, yeah, so is yours. They trade pawns, they shake hands, and agree to withdraw. Just a terrific game. Okay, guys, we'll see you Sunday.